if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? And verse 38 helps frame this. If anyone is ashamed of me, Jesus says, and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite term for himself, will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. So verse 38 actually helpfully explains or, or backfills some content for us into this question of what does it mean to take up our cross? Because uh, it sets the context for what Jesus is driving at. So Jesus here is speaking into a context and he's talking about shame. Are you ashamed of me or will I be ashamed of you when I return? And if a person is ashamed of Jesus, or if Jesus will be ashamed of them, Jesus says it's because they refuse to identify with Jesus in that way. And so one of the things we we have to remember here, and when we're reading the New Testament, is that this is written into an honor-shame culture. And many cultures in, uh, in the world today run on the operating system of honor and shame. Many Asian cultures do, uh, many Latin cultures, and many African cultures do. And it, it governs relationships in such a significant and powerful way that we in the West don't always understand and pick up. And so um, to be subject in an honor-shame culture to public shame and humiliation beyond your extended family group is just horrific because then you're, not only you as an individual, which in the West we kind of shrug that off and say, ah, oh, whatever, I don't care what people think about me, but in an honor-shame culture, you care not only deeply what people think about you, but you then reflect on your family and your social group as a whole. And so if Jesus says, you know, that there's shame or scorn in a public way, not just for you, but for your whole group being identified or non-identified in this, then that's a big deal. Well, what does this have to do with the phrase, taking up your cross? I mean, we use this in, in modern discipleship language as kind of a shorthand for kind of following Jesus when there is a cost to it in some way. But the ancient world wouldn't really have had that understanding. What Jesus' hearers and his first disciples would probably have had in their mind is the very literal meaning that then Jesus ended up enacting later on was literally taking that cross beam of the cross and carrying it through the city on the way to public crucifixion. Because to take up your cross had really only one meaning. You were a criminal. You were condemned to die. And so one of the ways that the, that the state uh, played on this notion of public shame was saying, well then, this would be fantastic if we had a parade and you could go through the whole city and the whole city was invited to come out and heap shame and scorn on you as you walked through with that cross beam on your back so that they, everyone in the city knew, whatever this person did, do not do that. Because this is what will happen, not just to you as an individual, and your untimely demise, but your whole family. Like, really, look at that person. Oh, their parents must have really let things go in that household. Like, there was just this sense of how horrible it would have been to be, uh, to be publicly humiliated in that way. And so Jesus' invitation to those who are wanting to follow after him is radical, and it would just have jarred their thinking when he says, take up your cross. And one of the things that he's signaling here to not only his first hearers, but to us as well, is this sense of willingness to endure scorn and shame and hardship, and, and yes, sometimes even death for and with or because of your identification with Jesus. And, and the crowd listening to this would have been completely horrified that that would have anything to do with association with what still at that time was a fairly prominent, public, well-revered, rabbinical figure or teacher. 
And the disciples, you can, you can just hear them time and again coming back to this sense of, of ah, we're perplexed, Jesus. We want to follow you, but like, there's just so many things that we need to get weighed out in our minds. And, and so it's just a reminder for us that um, there is a cost to following Jesus. And, and we don't always, or sometimes to us in our culture, that's a lower cost uh, to us. But in many places and in many family systems, maybe you're one of the only people who is seeking after Jesus in your family system, there is a cost to that. And there's a weight that comes and so Jesus is well aware of that and, and knows that and put that right embedded into the sense of what it means to follow after him. And the second part of that uh, that, that came up in another question was uh, in the same sort of set of weekends on this topic of discipleship. So the question asker frames it this way, uh, quote, on the topic of discipleship versus decisionism, where we were talking about that easy sense of, uh, oh, just pray a prayer, you know, uh, and that, uh, that modern evangelicalism has slipped into. The question that arose for this person was, then how urgent is discipleship? How much should we participate in outside systems? Is a comfortable middle-class life not still a prioritization of money over Christ's call? So this is, I think, a really interesting question, and I made a few assumptions about what the question asker is about because all the questions that come in are anonymous, so we don't reply to them and ask for clarification. Um, so I'm going to head in a direction. If you ask this question, and it is not at all the direction that you were anticipating that I would head in, and therefore questions still emerge for you, then text back in, and we can keep the conversation going. Um, but what I want to say is, first of all, that... The call to discipleship that Jesus makes is a call to all Christians. There is no kind of special class of people who, as they begin to get further on in the journey with Jesus, oh, they're really being discipled now, or they're real disciples uh, of Jesus. The call to discipleship is a call to followership, to all of us. All Christians are to be disciples. And I love what uh, John Stott said in his little book, The Radical Disciple. He said this, quote, Basic to all discipleship is our resolve not only to address Jesus with polite titles, but to follow his teaching and to obey his commands. So all, the invitation to all Christians is to follow Jesus in discipleship. But not all calls to discipleship are for all disciples. So uh, an example might be in uh, Mark chapter 10. There is a young man who comes and asks Jesus a series of questions. And his primary question is, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus goes through a series of conversations with him and ends up getting down into a real specific call to this man. And in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, Jesus says to him, Go, in order, if we want eternal life, great, go sell all of your possessions, give your money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. And so the question that we wrestle with in a text like that is, is Jesus saying that to everybody at all times? Like, is that really a call to radical discipleship? Should we all be selling all of our possessions and following Jesus in that way? But if you, if you trace Jesus' conversations through with other people, Jesus doesn't ask the same thing of all of the people that come to him. Jesus doesn't make this request or invitation of everyone who approaches him. The issue of economics and prioritization of money over followership is a hang-up, for some people, including this particular disciple. And so Jesus actually is quite discerning. And when he gets into the place where he really understands what the person's unique kind of barrier to discipleship is, in, in those moments, Jesus is completely fearless and goes straight for the juggler. And actually names specifically in the person's life what is holding them back from followership 
in some way. And so one way of thinking about this in our own lives is what areas of your life, what areas of my life actually need the most urgent attention when it comes to our discipleship? If Jesus was speaking to you, what would Jesus be putting Jesus' finger on most particularly or pointedly? Because for each of us, there's actually unique things that are going to hang us up or trip us up in our journey with Jesus and need some unique attention in a focused way. And, and for um, most of us here in North America, we are in generally less need of discipleship on the topic of, say, polygamous relationships than our, some of our African brothers and sisters are. However, generally speaking, we are in more need of discipleship with respect to our finances. Because of all Christians in the global family of faith, historic and present, we probably like to think of it as our money most, more than most. And so we feel particularly magnanimous if we give just a bit of it to Jesus from time to time. And, and there are then... Um, Streams of Christian tradition that are responding to that and calling people to radical places of, uh, that they would see uh, in Acts chapter 2, for example, like a communal life together where they share all and pool all of their resources uh, and, and live in that way. And then further than that, throughout Christian history, there have been streams of Christian asceticism where uh, people have been uh, called to radical poverty. And, and some of that has gotten a little bit out of hand because the, the view then emerges in some of those practices, and they've been in monastic communities, that the call to uh, give up everything and pursue Jesus is really for the super-Christian, highly spiritual people. So the less possessions you have, then the more spiritual you are. And I think one of the challenges with this is that the Bible doesn't seem to teach that poverty is in and of itself godly. But it does come back time and time and time again to what are the things that are going to prevent us from loving God well and loving our neighbors well, and regardless of our economic status. And Jesus is pretty clear in his teaching that economics and money and power uh, can have a real sense of grip on our lives. And so middle-class suburban life in North America in the time in which we live has its own unique set of discipleship challenges. And so we want not to be those who just simply explain away a text like um, that text in Mark 10, go sell your possessions, give your money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and just find a way to conveniently explain it away so that we don't have to live that out in some way. We need to ask the question, is Jesus, what is Jesus asking us to do? And where is Jesus really pressing us as a community, as a whole, and then as an individual and as a family? And part of our call is just to ask the question of what's being in front of put in front of us as a vision of the good life as a culture. What does that mean for our culture? And then to hold that up to the lens of Scripture and see if there are areas of congruity or non-congruity. And some of the values and the visions of what a good life is and means and characterize suburbia are fairly antithetical to the teachings and example of Jesus the idolization of marriage and children to the denigration of our single brothers and sisters would not be well supported by the scriptures, but it's built into the fabric. It's hard-baked into the fabric of suburban life. Acquisition and the dangers, an unholy alliance that capitalism has with suburbia that more, 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 more is, needs to be resisted and all discipleship aspects, so the, the question asker said about outside systems. So anything that is an outside system or influence that is going to press into our lives 
and move us away from Christ's call to follow him needs to be resisted. And right now, one of the ways that we do this as, uh, as a global family is we try and get together from time to time with our global family. So right now, there are Mennonite uh, from all over the globe gathering in Brazil uh, with the International Community of Mennonite Brethren, or ICOM. And, and we sent a little bit of money uh, from our budget this last year to try and help defray travel expenses for, for brothers and sisters coming from the global south to that. Because it's good for us to be in a learning posture from people who are not in dominant in leadership in North American systems. And so one of the things that if you look, it might be confusing to you, on our website we have kind of two ways that we express the confession of faith. And one is our Canadian Conference of Mennonite Brethren, which has the 18 articles. But if you think about it, uh, our family in the Global South doesn't think within bullet points. They think narratively. And so there's a narrative version of the confession, and it has this sense of what do we need to identify as a barrier to discipleship? And then they use the language of turning from and turning toward. So uh, in the ICOM confession of faith, they say things like, as Christians, we are called to turn from individualism. So that's sort of a North American, uh, in particular, in our day and time, toward interdependence with others in the church and to prove ourselves faithful to the life and teachings of Jesus in everyday life. As Christians, we are called to turn from lifestyle choices that harm us uh, that to choices that nurture wholeness, healing, joy, and peace. We are called to turn from hating our enemies and ignoring our neighbors to showing love and justice for all. I think our global family to the south is calling us out on some things there. And it would be wise for us to pay attention to that. And so the question for us then becomes that sense of what is Jesus inviting us or you to turn from? And what is Jesus inviting you or us to turn toward? And, and that's going to be unique for each person. For some of you, the thing that might be uh, being pointed out in your life in, in this season might be truth-telling. You're called to turn away from speaking falsehoods and lies, misrepresenting yourself and others, to speaking the truth in love. For others, um, you might be called to turn away from status-seeking. Or you might be called to turn away from sexual activity and actions that are not honoring to the Lord and to others. And so the question that, that is being asked is what do you need to turn away from and what do you need to turn toward and embrace? And, and so one of the things that we encourage at Jericho is, is in that sense of community again, processing that. So find somebody that you know that's a trusted spiritual friend and spend some time talking about that with them this week. Hey, these are some things in my life that I actually think that I need to pay more attention to. Could you help me in that? Would you be open to just reminding me, calling me out on that, making sure that by God's grace and with the work of the Spirit, I'm, I'm seeking to turn away from those things. And so this is the place, friends, where we just remind ourselves, like this journey of discipleship is an ongoing, lifelong process. You never arrive as a disciple. And so this is this process of asking Jesus, what do I need to turn from? What do I need to turn toward? Is something that keeps coming up. And so maybe in this season of your life, those are things Jesus is dealing with you with. Maybe by the time you get to the fall, Jesus will be speaking to you about finances or maybe about your prayer life. Next year, it might be about how you use your time. And so as disciples, we're just continuously trying to recalibrate and say, Jesus, where do I need to pay attention to and what do I need to turn away from and what do I need to turn toward? So that's, that's just a, hopefully a deeper explanation of our thoughts on discipleship and things that might trip us up and what that looks like. All right, we're going to keep going. Question four uh, of six questions is about heresy and orthodoxy. So this person said, um, in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 4 and verse 13, amongst other texts, it warns us about false branches 
of Christianity, going back to the beginning. So if you have your Bible you can, or on your device, turn to 2 Corinthians, Corinthians sorry, chapter 11, verses 4 and 13, so you see what this person's framing. Are there denominations that we officially do not recognize as Christians, though they claim the label? So let me l- read a little bit here of the conversation, so you can get a sense of the flow in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. In verse 3, Uh, Paul says this, but I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. Verse 4, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach or a different kind of spirit than the one you received or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. Uh, And then Paul goes on, these people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers. They disguise themselves as apostles of Christ, verse 14. But I'm not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they'll get the punishment that their wicked deeds deserve. So just a few things, I think, to note here in in the context of the conversation. One is that we are all susceptible and capable of being deceived. Paul's clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, about this. And he reminds him, oh, if you think that you're standing strong, yeah, be careful not to fall. Um, the text in the Old Testament reminds us, the heart is deceitfully wicked. And, and so any one of us is possible to fall into any number of errors in our lives. But the question that I hear this person asking is, well, how do you recognize something as false? And part of the Anabaptist vision is going back to that previous question about community. We, we have a community around us that will hopefully provide a corrective to this because um, error often does begin at the individual level. Somebody gets in their head, becomes convinced of something that maybe doesn't square with Scripture or is a highly individualized or highly personal interpretation of one part of Scripture. And then they begin to teach it. And it becomes, kind of catches a little bit for whatever reasons. And pretty soon they've got followers. uh, And and then pretty soon, historically, you've got a whole group named after you. And you've led, you know, a whole denomination or a whole sect of things. Uh, and, and I think uh, one of the things that we were talking about in our small group this last week, Stuart Murray, who's an Anabaptist in the UK, um, and, and he says this, quote, individualist interpretations that are not open to the weighing by the congregation throughout history have been considered illegitimate and dangerous. So, so avoiding error is a little bit like advice we would give to people walking home at night. You have a better chance of staying safe if you're in a group. Stick with a group of people. Now, the flip side of this is there are some cults that are very large and very popular, and so it doesn't counterbalance everything just to say stick with a group. On the other side of that, I think it's important to say that there's really no such thing as a pure undiluted stream of Christian tradition that stretches back to the apostolic era that's not been polluted in some way by culture or tradition or experience or personality. And so we like to think of ourselves as having this sort of uh, unbroken chain of sort of theological integrity back through into the New Testament. But that's really uh, not true. We're kidding ourselves if we think that that's the case. All of us are going to be wrong about some things some of the time and hopefully not wrong about most things most of the time. (laughs) Um, And and the other piece to recognize is that, that the experience of Christian history is that we have a characterized um, by periods of highly chaotic sort of idea clashes where there are movements or ideas that are wrestling for prominence in significant ways, followed by periods of stasis or calm. And so that was true in the first three centuries. There was tons and tons of heretical ideas or non-orthodox or non-congruent with the witness of Scripture uh, ideas 
floating about. And so there was a lot of tension. There was a lot of heated meetings and debate in the first three centuries about that. Uh, and, and then in the period of the Reformation and the Radical Reformation, we have another high challenge period of idea competition. Uh, and, and really, we're in another one right now. Since the beginning of the 20th century, through to the current fights between progressives and foundationalists, all kinds of Christians are arguing about all kinds of things, and, and the movement very quickly is to try and figure out why those people are wrong, bad, and evil, and to get them away from us in some way. And, and so the question here asks specifically about false branches, and I think I find 1 John 4 most helpful in this. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, if you turn there, in verse 1 to 3, says this, Dear friends, don't believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit that they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world. And this is how we know that the, they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, the incarnation, that that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet, does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Uh, such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, or one who is opposed to Christ, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. So the litmus test here when you think about it, is who does that person or movement say that Jesus is? Is Jesus the second person of the triune Godhead, fully God, fully human? Or what else, does the, what else do they say about Jesus? And as Anabaptists, this really is our, our anchor point. We would say that we are, we are Christocentric, or we are Christ-focused in the way that we understand and shape our theology. So we say things like, we think that God looks like Jesus, and the Spirit of God acts like Jesus, and the truth of a matter needs to be tested against Jesus. Jesus was not just a good person or a prophet or subordinate to God in some way. And so those things and groups that, that would identify with those teachings don't pass the litmus test. But it's also maybe not helpful always to run around trying to just be what you're against. Try and talk about what you're for. And so the second litmus test is what is the fruit? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16 balances this and says, keep a close watch on your teaching and on how you live. Because you can, you can get quite enamored with how right your teaching is and doctrine and, and not pay as careful attention to the how you and I live part of things. I was reading in our life journaling this week in Galatians chapter 6, and I was convicted about, even in there, Paul talks about correction and correcting others, and he says, do it with a spirit of humility and gentleness. And I thought, oh, I've got to go back over the last month and think about conversations about different theology that I've had with people, either online, in person, or other, and think, have I done that with a spirit of humility and gentleness, or have I done it just needing to be right and or prove them wrong in some ways. And so as we get into this final section before we celebrate communion, um, I want just to help us frame the conversation a little bit. So we've got a handout that I'm going to send around to, to everybody. And this handout is uh, what we would call our interpretive model as Mennonite brethren. And, and so on the question of uh, false versus true expressions, it often comes back to the Bible. How do these people use and understand the Bible? And so uh, one of the questions that I ask myself frequently is, what is the cost or consequence of getting this particular aspect of my theology or our theology wrong? So some things... It matters a great deal if you are wrong. So, for example, with respect to the resurrection, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ has not been raised, all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. So, it's important to get that part of things right. 
But there's whole other things in our understanding and seeking after God in Scripture that you can get either partially wrong or even mostly wrong and still end up sharing eternity with Jesus and others who believe different things than you do. And every now and then we've been able as Mennonite brethren to come to these places where, where we can disagree about things, even significant things, and still remain in relationship. And so as Mennonite brethren, we've decided on some things. Listen, there's some people that interpret the scriptures differently than we do with respect to women in ministry leadership. And, and so here at Jericho, we have full openness for women in ministry leadership across all ministry platforms based on giftedness, calling, and the discernment of the community. There are brothers and sisters, mostly brothers, who don't read the texts that way. Um, uh, and so we've decided that we can live together with them, even though there's some significant differences of opinion on that. And so the question that I'm always asking myself, in addition to what is the, is this important, how important is this to get this right or wrong, is the question, could I be wrong about this? Because this helps me maintain a little bit more charity and humility towards other people. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells a story about wheat and weeds growing up in the same field. And, and his followers are really concerned. And they're rushing about saying, like, Jesus, you know, in, in this, like, don't you see that there's a bunch of weeds growing up? Like, people with all kinds of bad ideas about things, they are not right. This, it's clear, they're weeds. And Jesus says, well, two things. Ultimately, that's my business to deal with, Jesus says. So the labeling or deciding who's a sheep or who's a goat, you don't get to sit at the right hand of the Father, Son, and Spirit in the, in the final day and be like, Jesus, perhaps you were not aware of what that person said on Facebook. I need to just bring it to your attention how off base they were on these aspects of theology. And Jesus actually says in the end, he, he's going to harvest the wheat and the weeds, and then he's going to figure it out. And so sometimes this question of just saying, yeah, they might be wrong about that, but there might also be things that I might be wrong about. And that relates to our Bible and our posture around it. And so I want to just highlight a couple of things uh, on here that are maybe a little bit focused uh, or give a little bit of a distinctive to how we as Mennonite Brethren interpret Scripture today. And if you're joining us online, hopefully the graphic will come up uh, for you. So just a little sort of recent history, meaning 1970s. Uh, we as Mennonite Brethren got into and then out of a big brouhaha that happened in the evangelical world in North America called the Battle Over the Bible. Some Christians were pushing really hard for the use of the word inerrant. And the word inerrant means without error in any way to describe the Bible that we have access to. And so they got together in places like Chicago and wrote up a big statement on inerrancy and asked other people to sign it. But the Mennonite brethren looked at the claims that the Bible made about itself and, and some of the limitations of the use of the word inerrant to describe the scriptures, and chose a different word. They said we would be more comfortable with the word infallible. So in, like, just like inerrant means no errors, infallible means no failure or without fail. And so it, it can sound like, whatever, Brad, that's like just a bunch of theologians arguing about stuff. But it's actually a pretty big difference. Uh, because an inerrantist position on Scripture can back you into some, some corners that then you often come out swinging pretty hard about. So things like the fossil record, or things like origin, or archaeological artifacts come, and the inerrantists have to work really hard to figure out where this fits in a particular timeline in Scripture. Um, and, and otherwise, they just reject things like science or uh, as just out of keeping or being anti-Bible. And it can be 
as if an inerrancy can be a difficult thing because if you pull one, it's like a Jenga tower. If you pull one block out for someone who is so wholly committed to inerrancy, the whole thing, Bible, tumbles. And, and so some of what I see people pushing back against their Christian upbringing and experience today might be people who are trying to react and, and they don't always do it in nice, polite ways, to inerrancy. Uh, and, and so infallibility is taking a different tact with respect to the Scriptures. It's saying that the Scriptures are God-breathed. The Scriptures are divine in origin, potency, efficacy, and they will always accomplish everything that God intends for them to accomplish. And so uh, when we talk about our interpretive model here, along the bottom, we believe that the entire Bible was inspired by God through the Holy Spirit who guides the community of faith in the interpretation of Scripture. And so uh, the question that the, the person asked was, is the Bible the completely inerrant word of God or is it just words that point to the word, meaning uh, Jesus, uh, as expressed in John chapter 1. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so in the Anabaptist tradition, we, we read the Bible in a specific way. We recognize the foundational authority of the Scriptures rooted in the role of the Spirit and the identity of the community as the primary interpretive context. So Bible, Holy Spirit, community. Now, that's not particularly unique, but then look on the other side of, of the diagram here. We don't think that just when you get those three things, quote-unquote, right, that you're actually done. There's more work to actually be put into practice. For example, down the left-hand side of that triangle, the interplay between spirit and community, that's the work of discernment, inviting others into the conversation. The spirit of Jesus who illuminates and brings transformation, is also alive and speaking to the community of faith. And that happens in prayer. It happens in dialogical small groups and discernment and conversational spaces. And then if you look on the other side of the triangle, then you see that the process of understanding, interpretation, and exegesis is important to us. We are a community seeking understanding in community, and so we test our understanding with others. It's also why we practice a multi-voiced teaching team here at Jericho, so that you're getting that sense of ability to hear some balances and not just personal soapboxes of the teachers that are involved. And then we still say when all of that is undergoing, there's still more work to do. We need more than just a correct understanding about the words and the word in John 1. We need to explore and interrogate. It's like a little Wi-Fi signal. First one is posture. What do I bring? What do you bring to the text? What questions of receptivity do you have or hostility that you already bring, like, oh, I'm not going to, I don't like Paul, or I'm going to not listen to this already. That's a receptivity question, and that's been shaped by culture, tradition, and personal experiences, and that shapes, and we need to name how that shapes our interaction with Bible. And then the next one is the apply category out from that. We're always asking, how does Jesus, the living word, bring clarity and significance to the biblical text? What does Jesus inviting us to do? How do we faithfully follow Jesus as disciples and obey his commands? And then how do we say, what is Jesus saying to put into practice um, in our lives? And this is a complicated task, but it's an ongoing one. And then, again, this sense of living it out in a meaningful way. And so we would say, again, Bible study that does not lead to more faithful and creative Scripture intake is inadequate, and if it doesn't lead to more creative discipleship, it's a dead end. And so I just want to remind us that, the, that our engagement with the Bible is always designed to lead us into a relationship with the author of the Bible. And the worship and song team is coming, and we're going to move into a time of communion. And communion is one of those places where we actually begin to press into this space in an embodied way, and we say, it's not just okay for us to think the right thoughts and sing the right words or hear the right words about Jesus. 
We actually believe and want to get to know Jesus in a more faithful and real way. And so our love for Scripture ought to spur us into that place of deeper love for the Lord of Scripture. And so as we move into a time of communion, sometimes we, we position communion as a time of reflection, which is true and helpful and wise, particularly if there's some barrier in your life that you feel to discipleship, something that you think Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm inviting you to turn from in this moment. But it's also a, a, a live and dynamic place, not just of looking back, but of looking right now and saying, Jesus, I desire to meet you here in this place, in this moment. We believe that it is possible to encounter the risen and living Christ, whether you are in your pajamas at home online or whether you are here with the living and risen community of Christ at the table. And so here at Jericho, that's one of the reasons why we practice communion uh, in an open-handed way. We invite reflection and confession, but not in a solemn, always kind of way. This is a place of relationship. This is a place where it can be rekindled and renewed, where anything that is out of alignment can be restored in some way. When you encounter the risen and living Christ, our expectation and our prayer is that things will and do change. And so the question that I would have for you as we move into worship in responding is, what actually do you feel needs to change for you today? What's the thing that you feel Jesus is trying to put his hand on? Maybe you say, I'm just so tired and maybe for you, you need to experience the restoration and healing of Jesus. Come to the table. Meet the risen Christ there. Maybe you feel uh, shame, and you need to meet the risen Christ at the table to experience forgiveness and healing and grace in that place today. And so as is our practice, we've got our prayer team available at the back. And today that's Constance and Dale and Wally. And they'll be available to you at the back there at any time. And I invite you to just if there's something that's weighing heavy on your heart in some significant way uh, and you'd like to process that with somebody, then they've got a name tag on and they'd be happy to pray with you. And the team's going to lead us in a, a song that is a new song to us here at Jericho. It might be a new song to you. And so we're going to sing the verses through and the chorus through once just to let it settle in. And then we're going to partake together of the bread. I'll lead us through that. And then we're going to sing the verses again and the chorus again. And then we'll partake of the cup together. And so if you need a gluten-free option, those are available just at the back at the kids' check-in. And so you're welcome just as the words come up on the screen. At whatever time you feel like you want to move into a place of responding in song, you're welcome to do that. If you want to respond in some other way, kneeling, moving for prayer, standing in worship, uh, then feel free to do that. Let's just spend time reflecting and worshiping in song as we prepare our hearts to respond.
I'd invite you to take the communion packet that was provided to you or at home if you have bread, something available. Sometimes when you come into a space like a church, the worship leader will say, and they have a good and kind heart about this, just leave everything at the door. Forget about it. In this space, we're saying the exact opposite. Come as your whole self with all of your cares, concerns, worries, sins, and bring that all to Jesus. He knows it all. He cares about it all. Come to the table. Experience the forgiveness, the mercy, the goodness, and the grace of God. Let's partake together. about that first enactment of the communion meal. Not everybody that was there had their things all together. Judas was, at the time of the bread and the cup were offered, a participant at that table. And so some of you remain unconvinced that the table is for you. But Jesus is the one who is doing the inviting. Jesus is the one who sets the rules for the table. It's his table. And he's inviting you to come, even you. Would you receive that invitation today? And we do that by signaling that we believe that this is Jesus' body that was broken for us. Jesus' blood was shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink in remembrance and celebration of that. Oh! 
Well, friends, I'd invite you to stand with me. We've long since left the live stream behind. Give a person a couple of questions. I tell you, they'll go forever on that. Uh, But let's just sing this uh, next song as a song of sending. And we want to respect if you have to go and you have other commitments that you've made uh, over this time uh, that that, that we are more than welcome to head over and pick up your kids and and head out at uh, any time. But this song, this is how we know Uh, gives us that sense of uniting together those things together. The Word of God uh, in terms of its written form. How do we know what God is and also the person and work of Jesus? We know what love is because Jesus was revealed to us uh, in faithfulness. And so let's go with this sense of confidence and goodness that we do in fact know what love is and we can and receive the call to live that out in a significant way in a meaningful way this week in the places that we find ourselves. So let's sing together. This is how we know. This is how we know. This is how we know what love is. Just one look at the cross. This is where we see. This is where we see how love works. For you surrendered your own. This is how we know that you have loved us first. This is where we chose to love you in return. For you so loved the world that you gave your only son. Love amazing, so divine. We will love you in return for this life that we give, for this death that you have died. Love amazing, so divine. We will love you in reply, Lord. This is how we know. This is how we know what love is. Just one look at your cross. This is where we see. Surrendered your all. This is how we know that you have loved us first. This is where we chose to love you in return. For you so loved the world that you gave your only son. Love amazing, so divine. We will love you in return for this life. So divine, we will love you in reply, Lord, and our love will be loud, and our love will be strong. Our love should be hands and feet to serve you in this world. So let it stay true.
mission be sent out knowing that you are known, that you are loved, that you are welcomed into the house of God uh, to commune with him, to receive grace and mercy and forgiveness in your time of need, and to then be, be uh, kicked out the door, but the door is always open, kicked out the door into the world to be his hands and feet. Um, so go in peace. <laughs>